Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 33. We must let go of the life we have planned so we can accept the one that is waiting for us. Joseph Campbell. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, today on the show, we have Jim Mercurio. Now, Jim is a filmmaker, a writer, and an author, and is a screenwriting consultant. And creative screenwriting ranked him as one of the country's top story analysts. He's worked with Oscar-nominated and A-list writers, as well as complete beginners. And I was introduced to Jim by a, a course that I actually have on IFH TV called A-list screenwriting. And when I saw his uh, his workshops, I was extremely impressed with his take on uh, on story and his approach to helping uh, writers with their screenwriting process. So I called Jim up and I said, Jim, I got to have you on the show. And he was so kind uh, and giving of his time to come in and share his knowledge and experience with you guys, the tribe. So without any further ado, enjoy my conversation with Jim Mercurio. I'd like to welcome to the show Jim Mercurio, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Alex. You know, thanks for having me. It'll be, well, I think we'll have some fun today. Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm here to pick your brain about screenwriting okay. and how to write a better script. Sounds good. So first of all, how did you get into the film business in the first place? Oh, you know, I always wonder if I'm really like in the film business. You know, <laughs> I spent a decade making these low budget films uh, from like 2000 to 2010 and they didn't make a bunch of money. But, you know, it's like the passion's there, the experience is there. So uh, I've kind of been like I'm outside of the Hollywood system and, you know, in the last decade, things have changed a lot. So I'm back to where, like, a lot of writers are, you know, writing spec scripts and, you know, taking a little assignments here and there. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just – you know, I love filmmaking. Um, I don't want to sound like cliche. I wanted to be a director. I mm-hmm. thought screenwriting was definitely a way through. <laughs> and, I don't, and, I, and I got a master's in film, but it, it, there wasn't a huge emphasis on screenwriting. So when I first moved to L.A. in the 90s, I, I wanted to figure out – screenwriting kind of inside and out like I had to kind of teach it to myself so you know kind of over the years of like being the student and then you know segueing into like development and you know producing and then teaching and stuff uh I don't know it's, it's, it's always been just about wanting to eventually direct and just be able to tell stories on this big grand scale um but like even as a even as a kid though like you know, like my friends were watching Star Wars and I was watching like 70s Scorsese and movies and <laughs> conspiracy films. I, I, I always came to film like as an adult, like thinking you can do really smart stuff and, you know, theme and like, you know, really gritty character stuff. So I don't know. I, I've always loved movies. I've, I've loved storytelling and uh, cinema just seemed like uh, maybe, maybe the Hollywood that I imagined existed when I, you know, first came out to Hollywood mm-hmm. never really was there or, or something like I missed by a couple of decades. But I just, you know, always wanted to tell, you know, be part of telling these great stories, these great character studies and like great, exciting stories, you know, on this big grand scale. Now, how did you get involved in teaching screenwriting and and your theories behind it? Well, like I said, part of my, you know, quest was I have to figure out the screenwriting thing for myself. Mm -hmm. So the first few years in Los Angeles, I was like working another job and I was just like, you know, reading every book. Writing, and then I started writing for creative screenwriting. And I said to him, to Eric, my buddy, who eventually produced a couple of movies with me, I said, "Let me go take all these story guru classes." I was trying to, like, you know, be smart and resourceful, save myself a few thousand dollars, and I'll write a review about it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, twenty some years ago, um, you know, I went to uh, 
Well, I think I'd taken McKee, but I, you I have to. McKee. Every, everyone takes yeah, McKee. I, well, I think I did them before that, but then as part of this process, I did Truby and Walter and Kitchen and Haig and uh, and oh, uh, just a bunch, yeah. of, just a bunch of people. So it was like, and then eventually it was interesting. I ended up directing like forty DVDs with a lot of those people. So it's like I was immersing myself as the student, but it's like to to know something so well, you kind of have to like if you can teach something. You know it better than if you can't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like I was learning this stuff and I was, was integrating it and I wasn't thinking about teaching. I was just like trying to learn it for myself. But then these chances came up to like eh, do notes for a friend, you know, write a script review. Uh, oh, you, you like my notes. Someone else wanted me to do notes. So as I started kind of uh, figuring it out for myself, I would call on what I learned from other people. But I started kind of like figuring it out. Oh, wait a second. So these are kind of the rules and principles that I'm using for myself. And they seem to be working. They seem to like – uh, align or or pull together 15 different theories or three or four different gurus into a way that makes sense for me. So it just started kind of naturally like, oh, I can explain it to myself so I can explain it to someone else fairly well. So why do most people and screenwriters, why do most screenwriters fail at screenwriting? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the thing with like first-time script writers, beginning script writers, people always ask me, well, what's the most common thing that's wrong with the script? And I'm like, well, kind of everything. And I don't mean it as a slight. No, I don't mean it as a slight. I mean like they don't know what they're supposed to know. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know the care and the time and the attention that it takes. So it's like a lot of times I think like with beginning screenwriters or if I'm working with someone as a coach or you know consultant, it's like the first and best thing I can do is kind of like open their eyes and say, this is what – great screenwriting is the, these are the expectations you kind of you have to have and uh if i'm allowed to go on a little tangent sure uh you know you, you see the movie the arrival uh yes i did okay cool little sci-fi movie they, they use a hyperbolic version of this thing called the, the sapir wharf hypothesis it, it's this idea that language that like the, your language that you have affects your worldview. So in that, it was very hyperbolic. In that movie, it was like, if you learn their circular language, you'll be able to, you know, visit the future and the past, and that'll be super powerful. And obviously, you know, real life, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, the cliched example, and I don't even know if it's true or if this is scientific anymore, but like, let's say an Eskimo has 40 different types of snow they recognize. Mm -hmm. So when it snows, they see something different than, say, maybe what I'll see because they know it exists. So, like, there's a different uh, view of the world. And the same thing with screenwriting. Like, if you know 30 different things and you just have names for them, like, you know, whatever, an ellipsis or um, exposition or reframe, just like little tricks that writers do or craft principles, mm -hmm. even if you don't know how to do them yet but you're aware of them, you're already ahead of the game. Because you're going to be learning them faster, you're going to recognize them in other movies. You're going to expect that your, you know, that your films and your stories should have them. So it's like if I say, "Hey, man, your opening image should always auger a theme and be like right on the, on the nose or on point with what the movie's about," and you've never even thought about that, but now that you think about it, you go back and watch your ten favorite movies, and you're like, "Oh, hey, wow!" Like I didn't realize it. But Citizen Kane has an opening image that does that exactly, and so does you know this movie, and so does Seven, which I know you're a Fincher fan. Yes. And, 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 and these movies, it's all of a sudden you're like, oh wait a second, every great movie that I've loved, I just realized, has a really profound and concise opening image that like augurs theme and sets up the character. And every time the character's introduced, it's like the dilemma's right there. So it's like if you start seeing things that you didn't even know existed, you know, like you're already ahead of the game. You're going to learn faster. You're going to start having that expectation for your script. So it's like a lot of it is, I mean, not to, you know, say, hey, those of you who aren't in the club yet, it's hard and you don't know what's going on. It's like, hey, no, just respect this. Like there's a lot to learn, uh, structure and character and theme. And then when you get all that stuff down, then there's like rewriting and subtlety and nuance. So it's like I just feel like it takes a while to do. And a lot of times it's it's not even that, hey, um, a beginning script is like, hey, there's a problem. It's like, no, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Like there's there's talent. There's some in intuition. There's some great moments, you know, d you know, and depending on your skill level or, or if you believe in innate talent, there might be different levels of where a script is. But it's not supposed to do everything like the first time or the second time. It's like that's why, you know, I respect and, and like, you know, like – 
I, it, it would be like, you know, it would be bad self-esteem for me to say like, oh, well, I spent all this time trying to help people learn all the nuances and, and you know, and finesses that can be done with screenwriting. If it's like, oh, yeah, it's kind of easy. And like, you know, there's really <laughs> only 10 things you should know. And if you know that and read one book, that's enough. It's like, no, man, this is this is really hard. And then like, you know, I'm still learning myself or, you know, or like in the last five years or my 20 years of figuring this out, there's still stuff I'm learning when I read like great screenplays. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing a lot of a lot of screenwriters and filmmakers for that matter think it's an easy process. And like, oh, if I just if I just put the hero's journey on everything, or if I right. or if I just, you know, use Truby's technique, or if I just use this technique or that technique, uh it there's no one answer. Yeah, but the thing is though, like we'll talk you you want to talk about this later, but like I I have a I've kind of focus on scene writing and I write about it somewhat. And it's like you know that that specific approach is it's not that you know truby structure or sit field or save the cat it's it's not that i have to say no to any of that mm-hmm. but it's like like an improv it's yes and it's but it's like you know one thing isn't going to answer at all like you know like vogler stuff is really good mm-hmm. especially for so, so, some sorts of stories but like y- you can i would say like like a lot of vogler stuff for a lot of stories is um what's how do you phrase it? It's it's uh, necessary but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know, yes, every story will have some kind of reluctance in the first act, maybe, mm-hmm. and there'll be threshold guardians. There'll be some kind of forces or people or elements that try to stop the person or the the protagonist from going to that new world. Mm-hmm. But if it's just an obstacle, if it's just an ogre in the road with a club, mm-hmm. that's not going to be enough. It has to be also on a psychological level. So it's, it's, an, it's, it's true that, yes, all these stories will have these obstacles, but if you have the obstacle, it's not enough. It also needs to resonate on psychological level. It also has to be aligned to that character. So it's like I'm very often saying yes and, like, yeah, read Save the Cat. Read Richard Walter. Read Michael Haig. If Truby works for you, especially the genre stuff, yeah, use it. And, and nothing I say should really ever um, contradict it. It mm-hmm. should just kind of enhance it or, or maybe reframe it in a way that works for someone better. So you're, what you're saying is that ogre with the club should be the long-lost father of the character. <laughs> well, well, it, it, and that it creates might, it more interesting. It might, it might not be so on the nose. Of it course, might just of be, course. Right, right. But it might be just the smallest hint of that, like, you know, I'm ready to I'm ready to leave town, and uh, I'm driving out of my hometown, and a policeman pulls me over. Well, that's like that's like a ogre with a club. But wait a second, what if it's like a guy from high school, who kind of thinks I think I'm a big shot, or kind of puts me down, or thinks, or kind of reminds me that hey, you're not really supposed to leave this town. You're you're, you're destined to be this small town person. You're not supposed to go to Los Angeles. Or mm-hmm. who are you to have these big dreams? And all of a sudden, it's like yeah, it's the negative father figure, or it's mm-hmm. like you know mm-hmm. the uncle who's a foil character who failed at it, reminding you of the stakes. It's like it could be a very subtle way, but like I don't I don't want you to get a ticket from a policeman because you were going too fast, and that's the point. <laughs> I want th- I want that to represent something, and if it doesn't, then that police Policeman doesn't belong in the script. Like that, that incident, that scene doesn't belong there. You have to find the thing that does two things, both story and character. And you know, like when I talk about you know scenes, it's like you want your scene to change at the story level, but also the character level. Mm-hmm. And pretty much your goal has to be always doing both. Like really, there's almost no reason to only do one of them. Or if you do it a few times, that's fine. But you know, you only have a certain amount of opportunities to get insight into character and to make these important changes in the story. So why would you pass them up? You're always looking for like the internal and the external to kind of like move forward and change at the same time. And that's a tricky thing to do as a beginning screenwriter. So it takes a while to learn that as a skill. Now, what makes a character, well, uh, since we're on the topic of characters, what makes a character interesting to an audience, in your opinion? You know, is it, I don't know. Like that, that's interesting because I, I I don't necessarily I don't necessarily like to like have these rules of like well this is what makes them likable. This is no. I'm more like here's how you make a good character. And, and the essence of a great character is very simple. It comes down to one simple dilemma. So like at a craft level, like if you could ask the uh, god of screenwriting or the muse of screenwriting, like one question that would pretty much define or help you write your entire script, it would be, and it can be phrased a couple of ways, but one of them is like, what is my character's dilemma? At his core, you know, what is it that he's afraid of? What is the hard choice he has to make? Because that will pretty much answer everything. So if you have that nailed down, 
really specifically, that's what makes a great and complex character. And I'm not going to be the one to judge like, well, is he likable enough or what kind of traits does he have to have? I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to be push you. I'm, I push writers and storytellers to be like, I want you to be good at this. And I want you to be good at writing characters. So I want you to understand what makes a dramatic character work. Like it all boils down, you know, to one thing. And one time I was saying this to a class and they were like, you know, oh, well, I don't think Shakespeare. Blah, blah. I'm like, OK, Shakespeare, what's the first thing that comes to mind? They were like, well, to be or not to be. I'm like, well, duh. Right. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, like one thing, you know, Godfather, Michael, you know, be in or out or the family's going to fall apart and that's horrible. I have to be, I have to be a criminal, which will eventually lead to me killing my brother. But, you know, to protect my family and the legacy of my family, it's all going to go away if I don't step up and do this. And obviously, you know, he has his own flaw, but, you know, or even Napoleon Dynamite, like the most important thing to Napoleon Dynamite is to be cool, right? Mm-hmm. But then what does he risk? <laughs> right, but what does he risk at the end for Pedro? He does that dance in front of everybody. He's willing to be a dork. And it's like that's actually huge. Like if he's just like, hey, vote for Pedro because I have this logical argument, that that's that's not – well, that's not good storytelling, mm-hmm. but it also doesn't give me insight in the character. Oh, well, the character's smart, and when push comes to shove, he's able to use rhetoric to defend his uh, friend who's running for president. No, no, no. A guy who's so afraid of being unliked and being a dork is willing to sacrifice, to make the choice of I will risk not being liked, being so uncool if – because of friendship and support and, and my alliance with a friend. It's like – you know. The idea of dilemma is kind of there at uh, its core, and it will basically help you write, I don't know, 90 percent of your script. So it's not so much I want to tell people what a good – what like a good character should be, but like I want to give them the power to, to bring to life the characters they're trying to aim for and to know kind of what their their aim should be, like how well they should know a character. Because if you know a character really super specifically, mm-hmm. it, it then allows you to – you know create the supporting characters that are more specific. It allows you to write great dialogue. Everything stems from that really specific understanding. Do you agree that a hero is only as good as their villain that they're facing? Well, yeah, but it's, it's kind of back to what I was saying. It's like chicken and egg. The perfect antagonist mm-hmm. is the one who tests the weakness of the character. So right. if you don't know what that is, it's so, so like, oh, hey, hey, I like to the protagonist. I'm the antagonist. I'm going to get in your way. I mean, does that mean like I put my arms up and like – move to like to block you from taking a step forward yeah you know in a story that's part of it but like but if i know your weakness and if i can prey on that then that makes me better antagonist and that challenges you more so now there's more conflict so you have more you know you have more to kind of fight you know at the beginning of uh la confidential Mm -hmm. you know dudley smith is a great antagonist he's a little bit like uh Darth Vader and that he's like he's more and full and uh, more whole than Luke is and he says to Exley who's you know by the book Goody Two Shoes he says would you plant evidence would you rough up somebody to get a confession would you shoot somebody in the back Mm -hmm. and ironically that's foreshadowing what has to happen later but he's also saying I know you're too goody two shoes I'm reminding you as, as conflict but I'm also for myself testing I know you wouldn't do those things so I know you're already beaten. Like you can never beat me because you're limited into what you can do. And and once you know that that specifically, then you can write better scenes. Like for instance, there's a little moment, like a second, where I show it to my class, and the, and the first time they watch it three or four times and they don't get it. It's a Christmas party at the at the precinct, right? Mm-hmm. And he, he goes off to the side to talk to him, and he grabs uh, two glasses of punch from you know someone. And he hands it actually, it, and he won't drink it. He, he doesn't take a drink, and it's like, oh my god, he's so good at two shoes. Even at the Christmas party, the holiday party, he won't take a sip of punch because it has alcohol, and that's breaking the rules. And it's like, do you see how that's why? That script wins an Oscar mm-hmm. because that moment and that specificity of character is able to be put on display. So you might in your head think your character is so well defined that you know him or her, but until you can use craft to reveal that, you know it's 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 back to intention. You're, you're not doing great screenwriting until you find ways to express that. So so I, I mean I always use the example of the Joker in Nolan's Batman. Which is as perfect of an antagonist as you can create. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the, the, the way he wants to kind of break the value system of Batman, mm-hmm. he wants to show people are corrupt and he wants to uh, – yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, he has he, his own he, method, he, he has his own methodology in his own mind, yes, his own yes. his own core beliefs that are yeah. counter, and he wants to literally break Batman psychologically, yes. uh, as opposed to like the 1960s Batman where the Joker was just a kind of buffoon in his way. There was no depth there. Um, if you're going to compete, if you're going to compare like the same characters yeah, well, written differently. I would, I would say that's totally apples and oranges. But, uh, yeah, I know, I, mean, I know, I know. It's I not really fair. Even, you may even have done some of this because like, I know I've seen like a lot of people go into depth about that relationship and, and their philosophy. And, and that's the thing. Like, you know, ideally you have um, – like, like I, I don't believe that you have to write that 100-page um, – you know, backstory for everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I actually kind of believe in precision. Like if you can nail your antagonist dilemma in a sentence, like those values then become the, like a contrasting sentence for the, uh, you know, for the antagonist, you know, it's like almost exact values. Like, you know, in a love story, you know, if, if he's, if this character is supposed to believe in the power of love to overcome stuff, well then the, the antagonist is someone who obviously is negative, doesn't believe that and is really kind of good at showing or convincing that person that love is, um, it can't overcome and maybe isn't real. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they're challenging the exact most important things to the protagonist. So it's like kind of chicken egg. Like, yes, your antagonist becomes stronger. Your protagonist has to become stronger to fight him. So it's like mm-hmm. you need to align them kind of perfectly because you might have a great antagonist, but it's the wrong antagonist for the story. Well, you might have a great protagonist, but it's the wrong protagonist for the story. So you have to make sure that what the uh, antagonist is good at challenging and making difficult – um, or the weaknesses he or she can pick at are specific to in align with the protagonist. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I mean, and, and I, always, I want to ask you a question. This is now a personal question I have sure. because there's a character that I found extremely difficult to write for, which was um, uh, Superman. Okay. Superman is such a difficult character because he literally is a god. So right. it, it's so difficult to create an antagonist that could – even uh, right, right. Uh, even do anything against them. So you got the Lex Luthor with the, the real estate scams of both well, like two different movies. Right, right. But, well, well, a couple of movies did it pretty well. I mean, yes. Well, I, the, the Superman, the movie, the 1978 yes, version. Excellent. Excellent. Right, right. Okay, so so a couple of things. It's set up um, with uh, the, who's the father? Jarrell? Jarrell, yeah, uh, Jarrell. Jarrell. He says, you, not that you kind of, you should, you must not reveal who you are because then people will hurt the people you love. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, so now we're set up. Okay, Superman is not vulnerable, but people he love could be vulnerable. So, so what does Lex Luthor do? He sends the two rockets in opposite directions, and Lois Lane is in one direction, and you know, New York's in the other. Yes, C- kind of the same thing that the Joker did, you know, in uh, in Batman with you know with uh, Harvey and uh, yes, yes, and, and that, I yeah, never right? saw that, but yeah, I mean, I never saw that connection. Yeah, I mean, but you're he, right. He creates he, he creates the dilemma, and and then it's also set up. And this is you know, it's a little bit contrived, but you have to do the work. You know, you can't change the course of things. So. Superman has to decide whether he'll go in circles and turn back time, which is a little bit out of the blue, but it's like, but, 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 but it's, just, it's at least on point. He has a big, huge moral question. Will you tamper and play God, you know, uh, as Superman or will you not do it? He makes a mistake or not a mistake. I mean, he, he chooses it, which makes him imperfect and human, human in a way, which, you know, we kind of like, mm-hmm. and then in this, in, in the, uh, the man of steel, uh, you know, s- mm-hmm. some flawed stuff, but a couple things like it's really interesting that, um, you know, when uh, Kevin Costner, the, the dad character, says you can't let people uh, know about you. And it was for slightly different reasons because they won't understand. They'll, yeah. you know, they'll have his fears. Fear. But, but an interesting thing was he goes, so, dad, should I let those kids on the bus? Should I let them have died? And he kind of said, and I forget if he says it or if he just kind of implies it. But it's kind of like. Yeah, maybe. It's like, whoa. Like, oh, that's like that's pretty intense. So in that final scene where, you know, he breaks the neck of uh, of Zod, mm-hmm. um, the dilemma is right there. Zod is fighting to hurt humans. He's like his 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 vision is like inches away, so he's fighting to pull his neck back. So it's like the only way he can stop him from killing those humans is to kill him. So Superman makes a choice that he never really makes or or is very kind of bold and like, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. W- w- but at least it's set up. So it's like you can't say, oh, he killed him because it was all he really could do or he was mad. No, he killed him because it was either kill him or humans would die. So once again, it's like they 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 have to make vulnerable people be important to him. And then the vulnerability to the bad guy comes through the humans that are vulnerable. And, and it's, a, you know, it's 
I, I, I'd say it's an effective strategy because otherwise, you know, what else, what else are you going to do? I it, mean, it, that's what I loved about Superman two, the, um, the Donner cut, not the original, but the Don, the Richard Donner cut, which he had literally three Supermen versus right. him and he lost his powers and he had to do all the things that he did. He lo- and, and there was just a lot of complexity there, which with, which arguably I think one of the better Superman, those two are probably the best still well, to this day. I, I'll tell you what though. I mean, like story wise, and plot wise, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff going on yeah. there. But 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 no, but I have a question though. Like if mm-hmm. I, if I say like, man, you come out of Superman the movie, the first one, mm-hmm. well, what did you kind of learn? And like and I, and I say, yeah, you know, like ah, man, they shouldn't play God, you shouldn't turn back time, and and you're really vulnerable to humans and stuff. But like if I say, what do you like? Like, like what's the theme? Or what's the character arc? Or what what's the thing he learned in Superman two? Mm-hmm. Like. Now I haven't studied it. We might go back, and it might be there, and it might be subtle. But like, like, do you have an answer? Like, 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 as I feel like, um, it doesn't resonate as much for me. And, mm-hmm. and and this is back to my like, kind of telling you like, I came to movies as an adult, you know, like so it's like, I, I don't want to be simplistic and say, well, movies should only be deep, dark, thematic character studies. Mm-hmm. But but also, I don't believe. Movies should only be obstacle course roller coasters. Now, when I say that, people always say, what about Raiders of the Lost Ark? And I'm like, okay, I'll tell you what. If one time in the history of cinema, like the most talented kinetic filmmaker ever was able to make a movie that was mostly roller coaster, that was amazing, you know what, Steven Spielberg. But like, you, but you, that can't be your goal. And it's, like, it's like a dilemma. So a lot of times writers think they have a choice. I need to make it the roller coaster. I need a plot. I need to have this cool twist or I need to be deep and have character. And I'm like – in my kind of growth as a teacher and as a writer is like no, you, it's not either or. It's mm-hmm. both. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's a choice. You, you, you have to choose to attack your weaknesses or to make sure that the side that's harder for you to do, that you work on that and make sure that, hey, my character study doesn't have to be boring and my genre piece doesn't have to be fluffy and light. I mean, L.A. Confidential, Lethal Weapon, Seven, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, these are some of the best Hollywood movies, you know, and they're genre movies, they, they, and they don't, they don't compromise. They're not like, well, you know, Silence of the Lambs, we take away some thrills because we're so thematically profound. No. No. It's, it's like yes and. It's like, you know, and, and this is what screenwriters say. Like, oh, well, I'm a first-time screenwriter, and I wanted to write something deep and dark. Fine, but is it fun? Does it hit the genre beats? Uh, well, I, I don't have to because I, uh, I'm doing this extra stuff. It's like, no, man, like do that extra stuff. Do what's special to you, but, but then don't like shirk the responsibilities of like what that everybody has. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, th- you know, my kind of thing is like, as a writer, you have a dilemma and, and the, cho- the choice is kind of like, no, man, do both. Like, like choose the hard choice of, you know, uh, movies can be both things. They can do more than one thing at a time. Well, no, absolutely. So, what are some of the story elements that you find in in today's blockbuster films um, that make it good? Because, I mean, look, Marvel obviously is you know has done something that nobody has ever done in the history of right. cinema. Um, so, they obviously are doing something right. Some of their movies are amazing. Some of them right. are not as good. Well, off, off the top of your head, what, what are your favorite ones? What, which ones work the most? The ones that work the most are the 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 one on a story point. The story, you just on story and structure and script and screenwriting right. and storytelling. Winter Soldier is okay. excellent. I thought it was, it, because Winter Soldier to me was just like a, just a good spy movie. Like okay, kind of like uh, the Dark Knight was a heist film. <laughs> Right. You know, you take yeah, Batman right. out of it. It's just a damn good heist film. You know, well, it, it's, it's, it's yeah, it is. But it's funny because I'm like the, the things I love about Dark Knight mm-hmm. are like, like or the things that like I don't like about Dark Knight are sometimes bog me down when I'm watching it again. It's like is the action sequences. I'm like the character <laughs> stuff and the theme stuff and like the dialogue is so amazing, it's so good. Then it, 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 it start like wait, f- like forget the chase scene. Like yeah, I know what's gonna happen. Oh it's yeah, well yeah, done. yeah, no, it's uh, well done. But like, but, but like I want to get back to the stuff. But about Winter Soldier though, okay, so so. Get, Give me – I mean I've seen it once or twice. I haven't studied it. So, so give me like the one sentence log line of Winter Soldier. Just, just, just refresh me and then – Winter I'll, Soldier, I'll, he's got to fight his um, – because I haven't seen it in a bit. I just remember yeah. loving it. Um, he has to fight not only um, – he has to stand up for his, for his uh, ideals, right. but he also has to um, defend his best friend. So, okay, also- okay, stop. Stop. So right, so, so right there. Hey uh, – Remember I said about a dilemma? Mm-hmm. 
uh, who, is there a strong dilemma there? Very who, much and, so. And, and, yes, you said it. But even even in your description, which was un, you know which was unprepared, and that's yeah. fine. It wasn't it wasn't perfect. You it, you immediately went to what resonated with you. It was like, man, a guy is caught between his values and fighting his friends versus his best friend, defending him, or defending his best friend versus what's supposed to be right. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, there you go. I mean, so it's like it's like once again, like mm-hmm. I, I'm not. I'm not the super commercial guy that's going to tell you, oh, these are the elements that make a <laughs> – yeah, uh, right. Hit these – no, save no, the cat, no, right. But, no, but, but, but you know what though? But, but the things that make a story great or have potential to be great are those – Deep things like dilemma and character and theme—they have to resonate, and it obviously does in there. The, the early Spider, the Spider-Man movies that Sam Raimi did, yeah, you know, the first, I mean, the first Alvin, two. Alvin Sargent wrote them. I mean, the coming of age aspect, but the, the dilemma and and his uncle teaching him the lesson, you know, with great response, yeah, with great repetition comes great redundancy. Um, just kidding. <laughs> shows up, that shows up. That shows up. That shows up a few times, but actually, they they they, they somehow didn't make it in this last one. But but the movies where the characters have something at stake, right? Where where it's real. Now, once again, if you do those movies and they're boring and they're just a drama, I'm not going to, I don't think that makes it like, you know, like if I was the film snob, maybe I was in my twenties and I said, well, that's what makes great movies. Well, no, that doesn't really make a great superhero movie. Right. right. But these, but these movies have like, like we did with Superman, especially dark Knight. I mean, these characters have really crisp and clear dilemmas. Things matter to them. You know, they, they relate to the real world, and it's like these are the things that can make something powerful, that can anchor it, um, that can make it – once again, I don't know how to say popular. I don't know how to say like you know commercial, but, but it makes it good at being a story. It makes right. it being good at what like you know really pulls people in. So it's like – Well, I mean like, look at Iron Man. You know, that yes. was pretty much launched the Marvel Universe. Right. That was remarkable. I mean a lot has to do with – with Robert Downey and his amazing right. performance of that of course, character. Of but that character changes dramatically from the b- opening character to the one at the end of the movie. Um, and he does have dilemma and he does right. have, um, y- you know, issues with who is the, the antagonist is. And right. uh, it was really well, well done. What's your opinion? I mean, yes. And, and he has the full character of like the father who is the flat, I want to say evil, but the flat, morally like uh, limited or morally uh, ambiguous, <laughs> right? Or they're deficient. I mean, the father made the choice of like uh, make this stuff so I can make money. Like, right. that's, like he never had a, he never had the uh, conscious or, or or the you know the doubt of his conscience. Um, but 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 he does. So it's like there's a foil character. Are you going to go that way? You know, or are you going to go some you know perfect goody two shoe ways where you don't do it all? And he literally becomes like the Iron Man. He becomes the mixture. I mean, I don't even know if this is like on a conscious level, but like he becomes the machines and technology, and he becomes human. Like he's the Iron Human. So he's the guy who finds some way to bridge the technology and the power with. Uh, Humanity. Guess, guess what? Well, with a heart, right? Mm-hmm. Literally, I, literally, right? and figuratively. Right. <laughs> you, it's, no, exactly. No, exactly. And, and the thing is, though, you're forcing me to talk about these things. You know, a lot of times I watch these movies and just have fun with them. Yeah. But like, but if it works, and you start thinking about why does it work, it's like there's a dilemma. He's the, he's both sides. He represents them. He's the only character who can straddle that. So it's like you know, like a, a protagonist who can um, synthesize. And be in two worlds at once. Mm-hmm. It's really kind of powerful, and there's really a lot of times where it makes someone special. And this isn't necessarily like some deep literary theory that like I, I espouse, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's other people have talked about this. But like, like, okay, so Iron Man can be iron and, and technology and weapons, and he can be humor and he can have a heart. But you know, in Good Will Hunting, uh, Will can be the blue collar guy who beats the crap out of a Harvard snobs, right. and he can be the most um, efficiently. Um, productive mathematician in the world and solve problems that can save the world. And to have a character that can straddle things like that, meaning they're whole or they have the potential to be whole, that's really, you know, that's really kind of interesting. And and even like in a, okay, even like in a, this isn't a superhero film, but like a great genre film, um, Lethal Weapon. Oh, Shane, Shane Black at his best. Right. So, but like, okay, character dilemmas or character struggles. One character wants to live. I'm too old for this crap. <laughs> right. One character wants to die. <laughs> right. Right. Can, can you be more? Can you be more concise? You know, in specific. And it's like each of them has to grow. 
to say the story. So I would say like they're pretty much co- one of the times where you, that you have co-protagonists. Like mm-hmm. um, at, at, right before the climax of the movie, the, the, you know, the daughter is taken, mm-hmm. and it's it's the uh, all is lost moment. When when not only are you physically, and this is back to uh, the paradigms. So mm-hmm. like. The, all is lost, uh, rock bottom, d- dark cat of the soul, whatever mm-hmm. Blake Snyder calls it. Um, yes, you need to be as far away as possible from the goal. So in Lethal Weapon, they've kidnapped the daughter. Mm-hmm. That's pretty far away. But that's not – that's necessary, but that's not sufficient. You also need to have the character the most – furthest away psychologically the most regressed the most the furthest distance from the where they need to be mm-hmm. in order to save the day so like in a love story it's not only boy loses girl boy becomes or girl becomes the worst version of themselves that aren't worthy of love that that couldn't win that love back that don't deserve it so so roger is lost his daughter or his daughter's you know he needs to get her back right mm-hmm. he's really far away from the goal but he is by the book and safe because he wants to survive. And he has this guy in front of him who's presenting the attitude of lethal weapon, whatever to kill. And, and he says, you have to do it. My-. And it's really, you know, and it's really like great craft because it's foreshadowing. Mm-hmm, it's alley mm-hmm. but set up. He's like, you have to listen to me. We shoot to kill. We take no prisoners. We got to risk this crap. That's the only possible way. And he believes him and trusts him. And they go in, and even though they get, it doesn't work right away. Like he has to grow and learn from him in order to have a chance to save the day in order to kind of kick butt at the end and save the day. And it's like, well, wait a second. But yeah. Well, what did, what did Riggs have to do? Well, a scene before that, when they fake his death, remember, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? He the reason why they can fake his death is he gets shot, he goes through the glass, and and Roger goes over and worried about him, and he's like, surprise, you wore the you wore the uh, bulletproof vest, you have proven that you love yourself and life again, that you're not self destructive, that you're not suicidal. I trust you now, so when you say we get a risk because it's the right thing to do, I can believe you now because now I don't think you're that self destructive. Uh, suicide thing that I was like ready to, you know, kill or, or hate, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes ago in the story. So it's like he needed to do that and have that growth so that Roger would then accept his risk taking attitude as not as self destructive suicidal stupidity, but as like a conscious, clear choice that he's making now as his friend. So it's like you see how, like, mm-hmm. in this, hey man, it's just fun and people getting shot and, 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 and kidnapping and shooting stuff no it's also this character stuff and it's like the same thing as superhero movies man like i don't know like it's like i you know there are people who probably specialize in talking about oh the elements of the universe and they can mm-hmm. compare those movies and when a, so a client comes to me with that kind of story we'll pick two or three movies and we'll look at them and i'll break them down and i'll kind of like you know when i put my mind to something to see something i'll see stuff that other people don't see and we'll find that but like all I can say is like, you know what? If you want to write that superhero movie, mm-hmm. here's, here's what a good movie is. Here's what a good story is. And, and don't think that you can't have themes and foil characters. No, and I have to. You know, don't think that it can't be unified because, you know, the, the dilemma and the specificity of the character is what brings unity to everything. And that unity is what kind of, you know, brings you power. So it's like. Well, I mean, it's a perfect example, and I and I use this example a lot on the shows. I've said this before: is like you look at the Avengers, and then you look at the Justice League, right? And one failed, one right. launched an entire universe that right. made billions and billions of dollars. So to analyze the two of them and how both of those films, what led up to both of those films, you can obviously see so clearly where one you were so emotionally connected to all the characters because you had where you went on individual journeys with all of them right. as opposed to the other one where you kind of knew somebody and then there was a new batman well, that no one ever knew you know like it's, it's interesting <laughs> it's interesting you say that because you're talking about you know the the level of how good a movie can be is based on the antagonist mm-hmm. wasn't the antagonist oh. the, super, the stupidest antagonist ever like well, on, want, event- he, wanted, he, he wanted to uh have some power and do stuff. Like, I mean, like, what, what was <sighs> right? Yeah. So, so, so it's like you know, like, the, like, like they were trying to rush. They, they were, they were doing, they were doing fun stuff, like Superman coming back and being yeah. a temporary obstacle. You know, like that was interesting, I guess, or scary or, or interesting. Sure. But then it's like that was more interesting than 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 the dilemma or the meaning of trying to kill the other dude. I mean, the bad guy was like, well, 
Yeah, kill him because he's a dude. And like, oh, yeah, you all have complementary skills and you'll use different ones. Well, that's interesting for like a seven or 12 minute cartoon. But like, <laughs> it doesn't really, right? But I mean, like, oh, we all have special skills. We're going to come together and do it. Like, it's the A team. You know, but that, that, that was the 60s Patrick McNee Avengers, you know, like for a 47 minute British spy show. But it's, that doesn't, that's not a doesn't fly movie. today. Doesn't fly today. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just not, it's just interesting enough. And actually, you know, if you want to, tangent on this you know fincher and some of the genre stuff might be a great person i know oh, i know you're a fincher I'm a fan huge fincher so, fan. so, so, so in, in one of the movies i was talking about a seven so yeah it, we don't necessarily have to do it this moment but like at some point we can kind of like segue over because i think he's a good example of like like the best genre hollywood movie making but that doesn't sacrifice these higher you know oh absolutely these higher things. Oh, i mean look at fight club I mean, look at Gone yeah. Girl. I mean, look at any of his right. work, the game. Right. Right. You can right. create a spectacle, but yet have so much depth right. in character and theme and hidden things that you will see years later. Like I could watch Fight Club now. Right. And it's a well, different movie than I saw when it came out. Right. And I'll tell you what, Fight Club is a movie that I watched once or twice. Love it. I, I recognize it's brilliant. I just never really kind of had a reason or like, to like, I don't want to say ruin it, but like, I just never studied it to death. Like, like I get mm-hmm. it, the ultra ego stuff. And on our second viewing, it has extra levels because all the setup for the, uh, you know, like he'll do the fight scene with the guy, and then he'll do the point of view of <laughs> him fighting himself, right? right? But that's, but that's, that's brilliant. I mean, that, that's, that's how you like. If you can get surprise and twist in scenes that are completely based on setup from what you've already shown us, then that scene doesn't need setup and exposition. It just is. And then the power is that you're seeing it with already a set of expectations and already a, uh, an understanding of what you want to get from it and why the things you see are surprising. So rather than having to have the moment where you explain why this next scene coming up is interesting or what people want in it, it's already in the, in the texture of, of the movie. And, and talk about – I'll tell you what, okay, so let me talk a little bit about Fincher for a second. Yep, let me just let me just, let me just claim this. I don't I don't think that my appreciation for Fincher or my finding some common ground with with obviously what I feel like um, is his ethos of filmmaking. I'm not saying I'm as good as that or I'm worthy or whatever. I'm just saying it's like I watch his stuff and it's like if I had written the perfect screenwriting manifesto and put it out in the world it was as if like he embraced it because he never ever violates a principle that i teach Mm -hmm. and it's like i'm actually more proud of myself that like i've come up with like all my theories and stuff and then one of the greatest filmmaker storytellers you know alive working right now seems to kind of you know implicitly almost prove or show that i'm i'm on the right track in some way like like <laughs> he just he just won't so like for instance like i say opening image is always right on of course but you, you remember the opening image for uh, gone girl i don't know off the top of my head i don't it's, remember it's, it's in a book too so good for her because you know the author was doing this but it's the picture of the wife's head <laughs> and he's like i want to get in that head and it's like, oh my God, he means psychologically understand her <laughs> to see if emotions because she's a sociopath, but it might mean, and it does mean, I want to crack it open. And it's, it, it, or that's what you're supposed to think it means. It's like, oh my God, in like an image in five seconds, this movie has already announced what it's about, mm-hmm. what it's going to be about. Like the, the, the irony of like the two of like, well, wait a second, is she getting in her head like, you know, you know. Figuratively, or did he, did he break into her head? So it's like it's so right on. So like, like and same thing. Introduction to characters, like in the game, which I, I don't, I haven't really studied that much. But like, one time I said, you know, Fincher always introduces his characters very, very, very concisely. Mm-hmm. So I said one of the first images of the Michael Douglas character is he, that beautiful shot of San Francisco down the hill, and his car is smoothly in the grooves of the. Uh, uh, trolley tracks. Mm-hmm. And it's like this guy's on autopilot. He he's like he's on the tracks. He's going straight forward. And there's no whole lot of thought. And someone said, "Oh my God, no! That's you're so reading into it. That's so like stereotypically, you know, bad teacher story and it's like <laughs> reading stuff." Okay, I'm like, okay, so okay, so let's just imagine that uh, I'm wrong, mm-hmm. and that when he introduces character, he doesn't make them. Uh, so specific and so unique to the character. Okay, well, how do they introduce the brother? Oh, on the phone call. Oh, line two, your brother. No, line two, a guy named Seymour Butts. So he's already playing jokes. He's already a practical joker. Before we even see him, mm-hmm. and the brother instantly knows, okay, that's my brother because my brother plays jokes. And then in the restaurant – and I mean this takes some work. I don't know if it's in the script, mm-hmm. but 
as she's walking up to him, Sean Penn has her. He grabs it off a off a. Maybe he has it with him. He has a spray bottle with him, and he goes up to him and he sneezes and sprays. <laughs> on his brother, but right, but that's, that's like that's like a pretty extreme specific thing. Why is that? Because he's a trickster. He plays games. He's a practical joker, and you need that because you know what? The entire movie is going to be based on you believing that this guy would spend I don't know a hundred thousand dollars to play a joke, a game with his brother, if that's not the essence of the character, if he's not someone who lives and breathes and walks and talks like that, Mm -hmm. it's like, well, yeah, believability. But here's the thing. You might say, well, that's too far and that's not incredible and that always lost me. Fine, but you know what? The filmmakers were good storytellers. They did everything they could do to make that kind of work. So it's like, so it's all there. So, mm-hmm. so opening images and introductions of characters. Can I talk about that for a second? Sure, please. Okay. So you know, the, I always talk about opening images being like so powerful and so important. And then I tell writers, you know, writers say, well, how long do I have to do it? And they're like a page, a paragraph, two pages. Well, Andrew Kevin Walker in his draft of Seven created an on-point opening image that did what I'm telling you that they should do in the first five words. He says, light fights through the soot, right? Mm-hmm. Darkness, light, trying to find light. And then I think in his draft, at some point, Somerset takes a switchblade and scrapes away grime mm-hmm. off the wall. There's a mm-hmm. rose there. Mm-hmm. So this idea of you know, light trying to fight through the darkness, good trying to find Good and through evil, all that stuff. That's right there. So, so he did his job as a screenwriter. Like he knew what his movie was about, and he did it in five words. Right, right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, I mean, you can almost say you, you know it's dark. You know it's about darkness. You probably even know like it's a mystery because what's you know what's shrouded in darkness and you know a story about light and darkness. You know, so it's like it gives away. It tells you the genre. It tells you the themes, and it's going to actually tell you about the character in a second too. Well, Fincher did something. A little more specifically, he, which is what you're supposed to do. And this is what you can do as a writer. Like you look at your first draft and you say, oh, well, it takes me a page and a half to get to my like theme and all the stuff. But Jim says it should be done in a, in a couple of sentences. And mm-hmm. Susan Kane does it like in a couple of sentences. Susan Kane, like no trespassing, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? No trespassing. Uh, uh, the fence. Guess what? The camera moves up and over, and you are gonna you're gonna invade this guy's life, and you're gonna like you know that was the whole point of the movie. Like you're gonna like violate this guy's life, and you're gonna mm-hmm. think that you could fi- figure out what's going on. So okay, so Fincher takes what so, some of the ideas in in that draft, and he does something really specific. So the very first shot is rather than trying to kind of you know I don't have it to show, and I'm not gonna lull you into it. It, it has a shot where um, Somerset walks in, pours out coffee, walks out, but. He's framed between two very peculiar and specific things. In the background is um, the window with the sounds of the city. And the script is set up that the sounds of the city were there. And he was trying to block them out. And it was like chaos. And it was like the evil world and stuff. Mm-hmm. And the front, in front of it is something that I couldn't quite tell what it was. But then, then I looked really closely, and it's a chess set. So I'm, I'm just mm-hmm. going to lead you to it. So in, in the very first frame, in the very first shot, you have a character who's visually caught between – unknowing chaos evil that's out there you can't know it's uncontrollable or um a finite logical um complete information world where wisdom can win where there's a clear winner and you can do it because like chess is like an interesting game because chess you have perfect information unlike poker where you don't see the other person's cards Mm -hmm. you see i mean now how you got Right. right, but how you got there maybe affects it. But like you see everything that's available to anybody right there on the thing. So right there he sets it up. So it's like – sorry, I bumped the mic. It's all good. So so immediately he sets it up and you say, well, once again, Jim, you're being a little bit too much. I'm like, okay, just let's stick with me for a second. Let, let's say it's the chaos and the evil and the unknowing. Let's call it chaos versus the order versus wisdom and experience and knowledge can win, right? Let's let's say chaos and order for a second, right? Well, the very first shot of him getting ready for work, which getting for work ready for work, showing he's a cop, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You want to do more than that. It happens to show him picking a piece of lint off his jacket. So it's order. And then the next shot, which is order, but ironically, it's order and it has chaos within it. it. It shows the five or six tools of his trade, a pen, uh, the badge, a switchblade, a notebook, right? Mm-hmm. And they're all lined up. So so 
as content, it's, oh, that's order. He has these things all lined up, right? So it's the first shot was chaos versus order. That's the question. Then it's order the way he gets dressed. Then it's order, but surprise. Within that order is the badge and the notebook and the pen versus the switchblade, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Violence versus order or or you know knowledge and taking notes in the pen versus the switchblade. And then it goes back to him getting dressed. And it's uh, once again, what part of getting dressed? It's him adjusting his tie, right? So it's back to order. It's not just, oh, I'm putting on my pants or this is my badge, this is my uniform. It's I'm – like you couldn't show a more specific, like, you know, orderly aspect of getting dressed, right? So then if, if I'm right, right before he walks out and the sequence is over, we're going to hit, you know, the note of order of chaos again, right? Mm-hmm. Well, as he walks by, he walks by his bed. The camera pans and lands on something. Do you remember what it lands on? Uh, don't off the top of my head. It lands on a metronome. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Right. So – and actually, in in um, the writer's draft, the metronome is there, like uh, you know, or like I mean, li- literally the most specific, unique, most powerful example of what order is, right? Mm-hmm. And he's using it to go to sleep. Uh, it might even like resonate with like the way puppies, you know, you put a ticking clock with a group of puppies and makes it sound like their mother's heart. It might even have like more resonance. But he's sitting there listening to the metronome to block out the sounds coming in from the window. So all those ideas were there. But look how what Fincher did. Chaos and order in a shot. Then order. Then order, which has some chaos in it. Then order. Then complete order. Then the absolute next shot is a jaggedly framed image of a bloody dead body. So in f- content and form, chaos. Mm-hmm. Right? So metronome to bloody red body. So 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 it's like, you know, a, kind of like in a true romance. So am I lying when I see, you know, <laughs> tell me if I'm <laughs> Tell me if I'm lying, like chaos and order, that, that unity and specificity is so right there. And Fincher is like – he's like a precision surgeon where it's like nothing is, is wasted. And like mm-hmm. then later on, we'll see that the, the floor of his, of his kitchen is checkerboard, right? At one point, he gets frustrated and he throws, yep. he throws his switchblade and or the metronome mm-hmm. onto – the checkerboard, right? So he's colliding these things, and it's like, once again, this rule of like, well, if you know what your opening image is supposed to do, and you know how fast you can get to it, and you know you can introduce characters, like the very first thing you see about them, you know, here's a guy who's struggling to keep things in order and and believe that he can, with tick tock tick tock approach to the world, he can save things. Here's a guy who's struggling with that, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all there. Um, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds, seven shots, 10 different paradigms. So like if, if you see that specificity and that's your job to, to be so specific, mm-hmm. right? So like – so you do it. Your first draft is not going to do it. Your second draft is not going to do it. Then you're going to sit around and like you're a beginning writer, you're a third-time writer. You're like, okay, well, I, I got to aim for that. So then you write it. A version that's a little bit on the nose, but you're getting closer. But like, you're not gonna let that go. You're not gonna think, "Oh, I'm done," mm-hmm. until it does what that does. So it's like, you know, these ideas of dilemma and knowing things and specificity, they they turn into magic. They turn into the elements in the uh, in the scenes that make your story kind of special and unique. Does that make sense? It makes it makes perfect sense. And I know a lot of people listening will probably think, "Oh, I think I think Jim's going a little too deep on Fincher." Uh, as far as like, I think he's he's reading into stuff that Fincher's doing. But I, I would say, from my point of view, that you are not because no, anything I'm, 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 and I'm, everything I'm, that Fincher right. does has right, right. purpose. Well, 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 listen. Okay, so so if Jim Mercurio can come up with this, and you believe some of it, so guess what? David Fincher is better at this than I am. <laughs> David, in fact, David Fincher is a master. I mean, I mean, he, he, I mean, some people have been criticizing him. He's too cool. He's too intellectual. But like, okay, okay. So 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 already you have a guy who working in commercials has already worked on the, the smallest, shortest forms, known as like you know a monster for details. Mm-hmm. And in like, if someone in the world is gonna do a perfect movie or a perfect sequence, or we're going to do something where nothing is wasted. Um, why wouldn't it be one of the top two or three directors working? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's like, you know, no, 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 trust me. He's doing that. And it's like, once again, if you think I'm wrong, go pick the top, t- your t- top, top 10 movies or, or be a film snob and tell me the top five movies that you think are the greatest movies of all time. And I promise you eight or nine of them will have that amazingly succinct introduction to character that amazingly succinct opening. Cause it's like, 
wait a second. So you tell me the guy who has her head in, in voiceover, I want to get inside that head as the very first five seconds of Gone Girl doesn't know what he's doing and is in control of what he's doing. No, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. All I mean, you got to do is watch Seven and Fight Club and Social yeah. Network and well, all of them. Hey, no, exactly, exactly. It's, it's the same thing with Social Network. You know, he, he has an eight-minute-long scene, right? The talkie oh, scene. Yes. <laughs> but, then, then, but then, I say an opening image sums it all up. So you say, "Well, Jim, uh, that was an opening image. That was eight pages of talk." Well, first of all, yeah. if you listed the ten things the opening image is supposed to do, that does eight of them. Sets up the world. Sets up the the rules. Okay. But then in the script, there's like four or five lines, three little paragraphs of him walking back to get to the dorm. And it says, and the only place he feels comfortable. Fincher turned that into like a $3 million sequence. It's one of the biggest sequences of the movie. He goes through Harvard every single moment. Someone's doing something, always in couples, go in the opposite direction. No one's ever going the right direction. Oh, well, that's, that's you picking on it. Well, okay, look at the 17 shots and tell me, the, how come never one person is alone, never one person is pointing in the same direction or moving in the same direction? He's going against all that stuff. He gives you the opening image second. But he, he goes through, and even though he kind of doesn't have to because he probably nailed it in all the dialogue. Oh, he, he said sp- yeah. He did, then yeah. spends 90 seconds – well, Sorkin does, but Fincher decided to spend um, two minutes of the film in like four days of shooting in a $2 million sequence <laughs> of him going – right? <laughs> right. He, it was so important to get him across there and show that and set him up. So it's like once again, tell me I'm not lying. Like, like So yeah, he broke the rules about opening him. Just no, he didn't. He bent the rules and then did exactly, exactly what I said he – you should do, and he should do. So it's like, yeah, he broke the rules, bent the rules, but guess what? He did everything we just said we should do. So it's like, you know, I playfully challenge you, you know, or, or at some point, if we do a follow up, like, you know, let's let's think about ten classic movies of all time, and just ask yourself, wait a second, did they do that? Yeah, did those filmmakers. Do that? And you're gonna find, you're gonna find always that, you know, uh, pretty much always that it's right there that the, you know, the filmmakers are doing that. And it's funny because. I sometimes do people say, Jim, you go too far because as a filmmaker, I definitely bring my my uh, kind of filmmaking and understanding of like all the other parts of filmmaking, editing and lighting and, and, and you know cinematography. I bring that into my screenwriting teaching. And if you were to say, well, here's where most people say screenwriting ends and directing and filmmaking kind of begin, you know, on a scale from one to 100, let's say like screenwriters end at 40 and then the, the process, filmmaking process takes over, right? Mm-hmm. Now – there's definitely going to be times when I might talk – maybe some of what I was talking about, maybe some of it is a little bit more of the filmmaker stuff, like uh, like the checkered the checkered uh, floor mm. is probably filmmaker stuff. But let's say I talk about stuff that's in the 80s, 90s, and like, you know what? That's definitely director stuff. But I'll tell you what, almost – or 9 out of 10 screenwriters would be better off you know, misfiring in my direction, starting or trying to put a little bit too much or worrying about a little bit too much details because a movie is what you see and what you hear. Mm-hmm. The only difference is on a, a screenwriter has the page, a director has the whole actual canvas in the screen to do it. But it's like most screenplays are not as visual as they could be. They're not using as many of the tools and uh, understanding of what, you know, kind of, of what film can do. So it's like I definitely believe that for, on average screenwriters need to come more in my direction and kind of take more responsibility for – the visuals and images and details that they put on the page. And if they overshoot by a little bit, fine. It's really easy to cut back. Oh, it's much easier. It's much easier to pull back than it is to push. Yeah. And the the thing is, though, I I promise you almost 99 of 100 screenwriters would be better off if they err a little bit more, assuming I'm wrong, or towards my side of like, well, wait a second, go a little bit further than what the screenwriting books tell you as far as what you can do. Because, you know, if you – if you can nail how someone dresses, how it sums them up, then you know, kind of put you know, put put that in there. And, and it's like, or if you even know, wait a second, I know that wardrobe is something that I can use. So like in in Dark Knight, remember he goes to the Matthew Modine character and he says, it's not like I'm expecting you to walk down Main Street with uh, your 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 dress blues on or you know your your fancy you know <laughs> outfit. Guess what? Then in the clim- his climax or later on in the movie, his character has on that blue outfit. Mm-hmm. He's walking down the street. So it's like, oh, he did do the most audacious, bold thing that he was challenged to do. He actually did that. So like the fact that you knew wardrobe could have a, a meaning, but and actually what you did more so than the wardrobe was you use foreshadowing and mm-hmm. you know and, and words to charge that item. But it's like you see how like 
you can do something that maybe another person, another writer wouldn't have done, but like, like, I don't think that's outside the realm of screenwriting. That's, that should be part of screenwriting. And if you're doing those kind of specific things, you're going to be a better storyteller than the average, uh, you know, the average writer. And, and oh, go on. No, no, no. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, just nowadays, as spec scripts, I mean, you just have to execute it. Like, there's no development money. People don't want to develop stuff. They want it to be on the page. So you want to write, like, actor bait. You want to write director bait. You want to write scripts that are like, oh, hey, you know what? This is on the page. This could be shot in three weeks. I could send this out to directors. I could send this out to actors. Like, so, like, my focus on scene writing and the nitty-gritty details that I focus on it because the best thing I can do for you business-wise is – help you write and execute the script that's in your head, the script that you want to write. Because if you can nail it and make it really attractive to all the other allies you need, like an agent can say, wow, this is really – these set piece scenes are really showy. I could send this to a director or this role is really fun and those monologues are great and there's some set piece scenes for the actor to do. I know actors who would play this. If you can get that in your storytelling, in mm-hmm. the, your execution, you are, you are so far ahead of the game because – People don't want to develop stuff. They're not buying concepts anymore. It's not like the '90s, where like a log line and a concept, you know, we get a million bucks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to, you have to nail. You have to be great. You have to be, you have to be both sides. Yeah, it's genre. Yeah, it transcends the genre. Guess what? It's great characters. It's great themes. It's char- it's roles that people would want to play. So like, you have to be all things. Without question. Now, do you suggest um, writers outline their screenplays? Of, of course, but once again, like it's it's a back and forth process. Like uh, I, I, th- I think I think I, heard, I listened to one of your podcasts, and they were saying someone was saying, you know, writers make mistakes because they don't do enough preparation. They, they don't they don't outline enough. But here's the thing: so, some of um, they, they don't. It's, that's true, but also they can't <laughs> because <laughs> like to to do it right, to to develop a story that's both working. On the external level and the internal level, which is what your goal is. Like um, a lot of times, the people talk different ways. Like you want a story that has reson- that resonates, or that's deeper, or that has meaning, or has theme. That really, what it means is that every step of the way, there's an internal journey, an external journey, and and it's like you can't do that right away. So so it's like writers should work on structure and they should be prepared, but then they write a little bit and then they stumble upon and discover turning points. And, and, and things that come next. And then they can use that to augment and expand their outline. And as long as they don't like, you know, write 30, 40 pages really fast and then get stuck to it and say, these pages aren't going anywhere, but are willing to look at that as like, that's kind of your outlining, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and you discover it. So you write 10, 15 pages. You just, you might discover a turning point after writing 10 pages and you throw away all those pages, but now you know the turning point you're aiming to with a Fincher like precision and like that created your outline so those two days of writing weren't wasted they help you write an outline that covers 10 percent of your script right but you had to write 10 pages and throw them away so it's like it's a back and forth it's a chicken egg so like you always want to ask yourself what happens next Mm -hmm. but like i'm just trying to build good habits your scene should always have a change that is a story and the character also another way to think about it what happens next but also a different way to think about it is what would my character do next and if you can follow those things and align them that's the skill it takes to be a good storyteller. That's not something that's going to happen the first time you sit down. It's not something that you're going to be able to do for like outlining a 100-page story. So it's like if you know that's your goal mm. and you have the habit of like, well, okay, the next thing is he has to go after and interrogate these people. Okay, that's generic. Well, how does he do it? Well, now he's really impatient or now he's mad. Now he's willing to break the law. You know, So it's like a perfect example is Nelly Confidential. You know, he was told earlier, would you rough up somebody to get a, you know, a confession? No, I wouldn't do that. When he goes to rough up the DA with, uh, with uh, Bud White, mm-hmm. and Bud, Bud, like, it's perfect because Bud White's the mentor leading the way. He's like, on your journey to quit being the goody two-shoes, quit being the super ego and getting your hands dirty, here's the second or third step before the very end. So we're going to take you on that journey. You're going to get information from the DA that turns the story, but you're going to do it in a way that's really fun because it's new to you. Like you haven't done it before. It represents growth. It represents like you moving in the right direction. So it's like that's a perfect example of like the story, external stuff. And the inner journey, internal, emotional character arc stuff, you want to put those together. And yes, you do want to be prepared. You do have to have preparation, but don't 
lock yourself into thinking, I, I'm going to nail it all in the structure and the outline stage. No, you are working for what I call like a phantom treatment or phantom outline. It's something that grows and builds as you're writing. Mm-hmm. But don't be afraid to explore a little bit, then come back and explore a little bit, come back because it's going to take work the first few times to get you know, all these things working. And that's back to the thing about – a lot of times writers don't even know what they're aiming for. Mm-hmm. If you're a first-time writer, you don't know you're aiming for that. You don't know like that the next step of, oh, the cop has to interrogate the people also has to have some personal character aspect specific to your flaw. Or the antagonist has to make it harder in some way that's specific to that character. So it's like – you know, first time screenwriter, maybe they don't know that's that's not like just a lofty goal. That's the bare minimum. Like that's what that's what storytelling is. That's what great storytelling is. So it's like, yeah, they, they have to, but also, you know, it's it, it's not about rigidly like, oh, okay, just commit to it, and because you say you, you're going to do it, you can just magically have those skills. They need to develop over time. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your new book, uh, the craft of screen uh, of scene writing? Yeah, it's it's actually the first ever book that uh focuses uh you know just on scenes Mm -hmm. and at first you know i was defensive about it like oh it's just for people who do short form stuff commercial stuff but but as i wrote it i kind of realized no 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 no. a a scene is you know really small unit i mean a beat is the smallest unit Mm -hmm. like a little change a little moment and then a few beats lead up to a change and that's a a scene but a scene is the first unit of drama that's a story in and of itself is storytelling in its purest form. Mm-hmm. You're leading up to a change and the craft to turn that change, to understand that climax, like I just said, to make the character and story change, that's a skill that's probably the most important skill in screenwriting. And people will say, oh, Jim, you're being too extreme. No, no, no. I mean, your climax of your movie is where your character art comes and like the, the, the clever solution. Guess what that is? That's the story change and that's the character change. I call it the killer ending where the goal and the need – the external and the internal unify into one succinct action that, that aligns them, that pulls them together. So it's like if you can turn a moment using both character and story and you do it perfectly, that well perfectly means you've drawn from character. Mm-hmm. You've drawn from the deep recesses of the character. You've drawn from the clever setup that you created. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like like in, in Fight Club when he has that fight with himself and you see just <laughs> him. Right. Right? Well, that scene – Works and the surprise comes from the fact that you saw the fight the first time, right? Without it, or or I know you. You know what? I I know you know like an eight mile. I know everything you have to say about me. I know your favorite movie is um, Shawshank Redemption. Yes, but, but 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 look at. I mean, that's a movie that that a lot that a lot of its success is having great scenes. It's so carefully planned out. Oh. So think about how carefully it's orchestrated. They, they decide to switch. Well, they switch the perspective a few times, but they decide to show the escape. From the warden's perspective. So it's a mystery. It's a suspense. Right. And we see you have this come up. And so then when you're ready to show it later on, which is a really conscious choice, it's like a scene writing choice, but also like on a one level, the scene or sequence where it's shown now has power because of the setup you created for it. It has a couple of things. It answers the question of, hey, how did that happen? But also because Red's telling the story in voiceover, it actually has an extra level to it. So it's like – if you can nail scenes and understand how structurally they work, that's going to help your scenes be sharper and crisper. That's going to help your sequences. That's going to help your acts. It's going to help your entire story. So it's like if I see three or four scenes, the first few pages are all wishy-washy and the climax has fat after it. It's not concise. I know why would I think that your climax is going to be any different? Because mm-hmm. that's all it is. It's, just a tw- it's a change. It's a reversal. So, yeah, I feel like my, my focus on craft is something I do that's kind of special. And I think writers will get something really unique out of uh, my really kind of microscopic approach. And, and it's not a niche. It's really something that's really super universal. And I'm hoping that it will kind of uh, get people uh, kind of excited. and It will be like a new canonical book. Because, um, I mean, all the great, great screenwriting books, like if I were to list them, all but one or two are from like, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago. I mean, you still go back to, right? You still go back to Walter Haig, uh, Field in some Truby, ways. I mean, right. But, right. I mean, but McKee's, McKee's book is solid. He's, he's good, but that's hard to read. Like, I, I can't say, hey, first time screen writer, go, go read McKee. It is, it is, yeah, McKee is not an easy digestion. I mean, like, as, like me as a teacher, I got to read it, or someone who, like, is trying to synthesize all this stuff, of course. Or as an advanced screenwriter, you, you, might, you might do it, but, um, you know, it, it's hard. And, and the very first uh, thing in my book, now, anyway, this epigram, epitaph, epigraph, epigraph. The epigraph in my book, a little quote in the front of my book is uh, from 
uh, Renoir, Pierre Auguste Renoir, it says, first learn to be a craftsman. It won't keep you from being a genius. So it's like learning this stuff, seeing what other people do. Like, like it's not going to prevent you from using your intuition or every piece of talent you have. If I tell you your opening image has to argue the theme and be right on, like, like what are you going to argue? Well, no, I thought I'd start my movie off with some junk that doesn't really um, nail it, doesn't really belong to it. Well, if that's the case, guess what happens? You cut that. You know, like, like if, if you have that in your script, well, cut, cut, cut. Oh, here's where the story becomes itself. Here's where the story presents itself and its themes and what it's about and its, ess- its essence. Mm-hmm. That's where you start your movie. Why would you start with that? So it's like even if you follow my rule and do that, you still have to have the magic. You still, you know, you still have to find the way, the clever, unique way of being on point and saying, hey, show me or I'm going to show you the essence of my movie in – a sentence or an image, right, or three sentences, and, and you're going to go back on a second or third reading. You're going to know or you're going to appreciate, oh, my God, this movie is what it was about, knew what it was about from the very first frame, the very first story. That's, that's something that is hard to achieve mm-hmm. in your great movie that you love. Uh, not you, but like the movies that like, you know, aspiring writers or – beginning writers love, mm-hmm. they probably do that and they're not even aware. Right. And that's the thing. So the very first thing I can do is say, man, appreciate this craft. L- l- look, like, let me be anal and show it to you. And it's like the sapper worth hypothesis. If you know it exists, it should change your world. Like if you know that nine out of ten of your favorite movies do these things, mm-hmm. what, what are you fighting against? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's hard. It'd be easier not to. Shortcuts are obviously shortcuts. What? But – well, you know, per- I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like it's a perfect example of like if you don't know what the hero's journey was, if the hero's journey has never been brought to you or even brought into right. your world. Imagine when you first heard about the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's right. hero's journey. Like it changed right. everything, whether you use it or not, but you know right. it's there. Well, once again, you can steal from all the stuff. So it's like, okay, so we know stories go up and down. We know things have to go down. So, okay. Dark Knight of the Soul and or you know Jim's Rock Bottom character goes down and he's and he's and he's far away from the goal. Mm-hmm. And psychologically, he's regressed to be his worst self. Like Bud White, Bud White goes and punches his girlfriend in the face. He becomes his father. He becomes the worst version of himself before he goes on and then starts thinking and helping out with Exley. He goes from his very worst to his character arc. Like that's the twist and that's the you know surprise reversal that I talk about in my film with like you know with great detail. Like if you can do it with a line of dialogue or, or a couple words of action description, then you can do it with entire story. So this is back to the yes end. So like you know stories go up and down. And you know at some point the character's going to be farther away from the goal and um, also regress for the worst self. Like in LA Confidential, Bud White punches his girlfriend in the face, becomes his father. He becomes his worst self the moment or like the split second before he becomes the character arc of like you know helping out, using his brain, not being like this angry, id-like creature. So let's say you know that and you have that in your story. But then you read Vogler, and then you think about mythology, and then you think Phoenix rising from the ashes. Oh, well, that's like a cool image. So like in one of the Spider-Man movies, something crashes in on Peter, and then boom, he jumps up, and all this stuff flies out. And like to me, I always thought of like, oh, it's like the Phoenix rising from the ashes. So like you may get an idea for an image – or a beat from like one of these paradigms and it's and it's not like oh well i was never ever going to know about this beat but it might just give you like a specific idea or it might just give you a specific way through it or my challenge is to say okay make him the furthest away possible from the goal you know if you're the guy who's writing a drama you might be able to say okay i need to push the story further away or if you're the guy who writes the story roller coaster obstacle course movies you might say wait a second Regression psychology, I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. But let's take – got to think about that for a second. What is the worst thing that could possibly – you know? and and it's like some little paradigm or some little specific insight uh, or example might give you a scene or visual or just open up something for you. So it's like – it's to me like if any of these paradigms resonate with you, it just just means they're working. It just means – because they're all metaphors. So like if – if, if if it resonates with you, it just means there's some truth to the metaphor. It's, it's mapping somewhat accurately or some truth and honesty, the storytelling thing. I don't think any of them are perfect. I don't think mine's perfect. Or I don't think any of them are necessarily complete. But if like all of them do 80 percent 
or if all of them have some good things you can pull from them, like, yeah, definitely learn from 10 different places that that's how, you know, I mean, that that's how I became like a good teacher. It's like, I, I, I went down all these paths and all these different perspectives. And I said to myself, well, I'll take the best and leave the rest of all of these. I'll collide them. I'll compare them. And like, I kind of came up with this like creative, like way of like, you know what? I don't think my stuff violates or, or goes against or puts anything down that's out there. Mm-hmm. I just think, I just think it also will add something specific and give you different new tools no matter where you are, what paradigm you're thinking about. I believe mine will complement it. So it's like I'm kind of a positive guy. I want it to be yes and. I want you to do all things. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to do just one thing. I don't want you to do just my paradigm. I don't want to say Michael Haig's better than Truby. I, I think this Haig stuff that's good. I think this Truby stuff that's good. And it's my stuff that's good. Look at it all. But I would rather you say yes to like seven things out of us than say, well, I say yes to three of those things, but the other things are kind of counterintuitive and hard to mm-hmm. me. So I'm, I'm just not going to make that policeman threshold guardian. I'm just not going to give a big psychological resonance. I'll just make it funny. It's like, no, man, like you lost the battle right there. Right. It's like you, you can't take away. In fact, every time you take away from something, you have to add more and probably even add more than you take away. And even like sometimes like, you know, Robert, Robert Altman used to make these like deconstructions of genres where he mm-hmm. would like trim stuff down and take things away. But I, I would argue as an art filmer, as a smart guy or as an experimental filmmaker, he was adding way more than he was taking away. So it's like you always you always want to look for like, uh, you know, ways to say yes and yeah, I'll do what everybody else does and then I'll transcend it and then I'll go deeper in these areas that usually most people don't do. It's like you want to be able to set yourself apart. You want to aim aim to be great. Your expectations have to be, you know, you shouldn't be aiming like, oh, I'm going to do like a cool buddy cop movie that's kind of funny or that's kind of reminiscent of the weapon. It's like, no, right nowadays, you got to write something that's better than the weapon or as good as the weapon or that's the modern day version of the weapon. It's like you have to uh, kind of go for it. All right, man. So let me, I'm going to ask you the same questions I ask uh, all my um, all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh well, like I said, I mean, just go. I mean, start writing. Understand that your writing process yourself is going to lead you to things. Like there are things you only learn from writing. So write, read screenplays, read some books, or read, or read parts of books, or read some blogs, uh, and, and, and just go back and forth with it. And it's like you're going to do all these things at once because the more you know of, the more you're aware of, if 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 you go and read an article, analyze a screenplay, and like he points something out that Fincher does, now you know it's possible you could do that. If another guy gives you a good idea about how to break in your second act, well, that's cool. If you read three scripts and you see every single modern comedy has an inciting incident in the first eight pages rather than eleven, then you can, you know, what I'm saying like mm-hmm. just 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 go blindly forward for a while, and things will start catching up and kind of aligning and accruing. And like, don't think that there's one way I can, I must outline and must rigidly plan, or I must just write from the seat of my pants because I'm a genius. The answer isn't no to that, no to this. It's yes and yes. Yeah. Write some, don't be afraid to throw it away. Uh, You know, discover, go back and and let that be your structure. And then, you know, one of the people you can come to is me. I have this big, huge 10 hour DVD set. Right. Um, my book eventually, or, you know, I work with uh, clients that have made billions of dollars in box office and complete beginners. So it's like, you know, that is something I do. You can check, you can check out my website for that. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Screenwriting book, either screenwriting or any other kind of book. You know, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if the how-to books did. I mean, when I was in college and writing my first screenplay, like I went to the bookstore and there was two or three books on the shelf. So I picked up like I think Walter and Field, mm-hmm. and, and they were like they were like incomplete, but they were solid and they were like you know they gave me a framework. Huh. Oh God, I don't. You know what? I don't. I don't have a good answer. If you don't I have think, a good answer, think, we can move on. It's all I good. Think of the, of the screenwriting. Oh, sorry, I think of the screenwriting books. I think Michael Hague's writing screenplays that sell. Mm-hmm. really started aligning theme and character with the story. I love that. And I think um, Linda Sager's book, yeah. Making a Good Script Great, which is which is actually in some ways not because of her writing, but because of the complexity and the details. It's a hard read. You actually need to have watched the movie, almost have it in front of you, and almost outline it because to really understand what she's saying, 
the setups and payoffs and nitpicky stuff, you really have to kind of know it. And in my book, I do the same kind of stuff where it's like, I'm going to give five examples and three of them are going to be like, oh, I'm not sure about that movie. But the two that you know are going to be so specific and so on point. So her book was very specific and really about showing you how movies are about setups and payoffs. Mm -hmm. I think that was very powerful. Okay. And then um, as a, when I was a director, a friend of mine who was producing the movie said, you don't know the actor – actor language you don't know how to talk to actors yet and he made me read this book called audition by michael shirtleff mm -hmm. and it was like how actors prepare yeah for and and what it did was the book is amazing it's, it's helped me amazing helped, helped me my writing to take those principles but the idea that you must consider the other perspectives of other people cinematographer editor actors if you understand their point of view better um it makes you a better screenwriter um not just on some theoretical like intellectual level but like on a deep personal emotional level if you know that extra that actor playing that small role is a person and is invested and is going to spend 40 hours making up a backstory for the guy who gives the tickets out on the boat you're going to put more emphasis in, you know in in details and thought into your minor characters because you know an actor a real live person is going to play it so like mm -hmm. sympathy and empathy and understanding for those other things intellectually and emotionally like that that was a book that was like first opened me up to that mindset. Very cool. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, let's see. I, th I think it's that, that, that yes. And, or do both like, like for 10 years, I was making movies, 2000 to 2010, I was making low budget movies. And, you know, there's this thing called deliberate practice. Like I, I was learning to be a better screenwriter and, uh, and I was learning to be a better teacher. And it wasn't like that time was wasted, but I think I wasn't writing as much during that time because I said to myself, well, I'm making movies, so I don't have to be the writer all the time too. Mm -hmm. I don't have to crank out the scripts, you know, as, as the guys who aren't also spending 5,000 hours making movies. And it's like, no, 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 you know what, man, it's hard, but you have to do both. Same thing with, I want to write action movies. What do I care about the main character? No, you have to do both. I write dramas. What do I care about twists and turning points? No, you have to do both. So this idea, I think, of like being whole and not – or like, I don't want to market because I'm just a genius. I, I got to admit, I don't teach anything about marketing and business. It's not my strength. I don't like it. Um, so like as a teacher, I'm allowed to do that. As a writer, guess what? I have to come up. I have to write the log line, which I hate and I'm not good at. I have to query people. I have to do everything. So it's like you got to do both things. You have to make yourself whole. Like you have to have your character arc as a writer and as a person. Right. Business and craft, uh, character and story and, and you know fun, uh, internal, external. You got to be whole. You got to like kind of because for you to put your best self out there, you have to access your, your whole self. And three of your favorite films of all time. Oh my god! Well, okay. Just the ones that come to your mind right now. Okay. Okay. Then, okay. I, I guess to give you two quick answers. The cliched version is everybody loves. These and I feel like I'm boring. Godfather, Chinatown, any hall, like like sure. everybody. Yeah. Okay. Bicycle Thieves is that is probably like my favorite of the classical. I'm Italian. I, it just hits me. Movies that like I thought I appreciated that were really personal that I, I found something surprising in. Breaking Away, mm -hmm. uh, Midnight Midnight Cowboy, mm -hmm. uh, Dead Ringers, Night of the Hunter, and, and movies I say like you know what? There's my voice. I wish I could have written that. Uh, Alexander Payne, Election Sideways, kind of comes to mind. Sure. Um, Breaking away, Midnight Cowboy are so jam packed with theme and coherency. They're they're just well. That was like, like that's like ten movies. You you did a good job. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, no, but, but it's but it's all you can't be pinned down. It's like no, I got you, I got you. But I tell you what though, if you think I'm going too far, like you could watch the first like three minutes of Midnight Cowboy and you could pick out 30, I'm not kidding, 30 things that point to theme the way we talked about seven and the way you think mm -hmm, I went too far mm -hmm. or the way you imagine that someone would say I went too far. You could look at the first three, four, five minutes of Midnight Cowboy and you could easily pick out 30 clearly defined craft you know, techniques and attempts to make meaning and uh, to set things up. I mean, it's, it's so jam-packed. It's perfect. And where can people find you? Uh, my website. Uh, jamespmercurio.com uh, you can sign up for our newsletter there which is free mm -hmm. um, there's some back issues uh, my DVD, DVD set there is there at a really super reduced price now mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to you know talk to me about the coaching or, or script consulting you can email me we can have a talk no pressure I mean my sales pitch usually is you listen to me if you like what I said you think I can help you you'll know 
Right. So like that's the there's the pitch. So like if you want to talk about it or if you want to check it out, yeah, go to jamespmercurio.com. Jim, man, thank you so much. No, this has been an epic conversation to say th- the least. Thanks, buddy. And also, like I said, man, this whole appreciation for screenwriting, like you appreciate it, and like I think you you get excited because sometimes you learn stuff too. But like oh, it, it's so vast, it's so vast. Oh. How- have to be and all the things you have to know and I, and I appreciate you fighting the good fight to get that out there and I appreciate it man look and I've listened I've listened or I've spoken to many of the people you've talked to almost almost all of them that you quoted in this in this interview and it's true like I've learned so much over the course of the last three years of doing this because right. you learn from these different you're just learning you I, I always look at it as this way we're all looking at different pieces of the elephant right. in the room no one's got it all figured out. But if you start piecing all of them together, you get a much more holistic approach to storytelling. And I think it's beneficial to everybody um, to to learn from as many different sources as humanly possible. So thank you for dropping some major knowledge bombs today on The Tribe. I want to thank Jim for coming on the show and dropping some major knowledge bombs on The Tribe today. If you want to get links to his course, his workshops on IFH TV, or if you want to get in touch with him for some consulting head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS033 for the show notes. And guys, if you have not already, please head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really, really helps us out a lot on iTunes. Thanks again for listening, guys. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y dot com.